Hello and welcome to all my participants in India and abroad across EPS channels in YouTube, Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook to your one-stop shop which gives you or one-stop show which gives you incisive analysis on a topic of interest from the world of finance and payments. Today's topic of discussion will be on revamping ATM industry for profitability. To discuss about the topic, please join me in welcoming a global market leader in revolutionizing ATM software, Dr. Arvinda Korala. Dr. Korala is the CEO of Cal Software, Cal is a global software company operating at the forefront of the ATM industry. Cal has a product suite of application that helps reduce costs, increase functionality, enhance customer experience. Their product called Calignite is a comprehensive ATM software platform built across industry standards. So uh, right in front of you, you have a slide which tells you more about uh, <clears throat> Dr. Korala. Uh, for clients and employees of Cal, one of the leading software developers for the ATM and kiosk industries, it's no surprise to answer the phone at odd hour and hear Arvinda's Korala's voice, anxious to talk about his latest brainstorm. If Korala, if, if doctor has an idea, he needs to talk about it immediately. He did his electrical engineering from Edinburgh University. <clears throat> uh, ladies and gentlemen, just as iron sharps iron, we believe that the region's banking industry will emerge stronger and leaner than ever. To remain relevant, however, each bank must reinvent itself, a difficult task uh, considering these pandemic times, but requiring strong commitment. We are at like you all, you must have heard, we are at test uh, like never before uh, in our lifetimes. Banks must redefine its value proposition and rebuild the operating model. The ATM strategy is part of that rebuilding model. Good morning, Arvinda. How are you? Hello, I'm fine. Thank you. Hi, KK. Good, nice good. Thank you, sir. See you again. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Thank you. Good to see you here. Uh, after a long time, I'm speaking to you. Uh, 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 doctor, uh, if I can call you Arvinda, Arvinda, uh, since you are doing business globally, how is it going now with business activities? So um, you were talking a little bit about the fact that uh, there is uh, this coronavirus time. Of course, uh, you know, banks can't stop uh, ATMs because ATMs are critical for people to use them for cash and other transactions. So I think our, uh, you know, our business is stable. Um, mm -hmm. Revenue wise, uh, we are stable. Um, banks are, of course, not starting big new projects um, just now, but they're doing all the things that are important, making sure that the ATMs are um, running and uh, existing projects that we were doing, you know, continue. So I think in many ways it's business as usual, uh, except, of course, everybody is uh, working from home. Yeah, true. That's great. So you see a lot of uh, economic activity and business activity picking up across the globe? So not picking up. No, I think so. It, it, it went down a little bit and it's, I think, uh, down and staying down a little bit at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I think it will begin to pick up because, as you know, the, you know some of the numbers in Europe uh, is, is a lot better. Some parts of Asia a lot better. Uh, US, not so much. So I think uh, it, it will be better. I think everybody's waiting for this virus to be conquered. But I mm -hmm. think we'll be back to normal after that. So I'm yeah. kind of expecting the next few months still to be a little bit kind of subdued. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, another few, uh, few, few, few months, perhaps. Uh, we've already spent about five months. So, uh, Arvinda, as for the website of ATMIA, the ATM Industry Association, ATMs were the first popular form of digital banking. ATMs are an inher inherently digital, if I can say, if, uh, for a short form of a physical digital device, part physical, part digital. How has the industry landscape changed due to the advent of new channels of retail banks, such as internet banking and mobile banking? 
So a very interesting question, KK, to begin with, because obviously um, uh, banking is a multi-channel business. Customers like to use different channels uh, when they access their banks. It's not that everybody goes to the branch or everybody uses only the phone. Um, if you think about it, you know, there are you know, four big channels, uh, the branch, of course, uh, ATMs, uh, phones, and internet, right? So yeah. from that perspective, um, one of the things is that each of the channels has a unique proposition, a reason why people use those uh, channels. If you think about ATMs, for instance, ATMs can dispense cash, and it is obvious, and it is clear, and then a phone can't. Um, yeah. Now, of course, some people might say, well, cash is going to go away. I think that's not going to happen in a hurry. We have analyzed this for a very long time. Uh, cash usage has gone down in some countries like Sweden. But, um, you know, we can talk a little bit about that. The Swedish uh, government and the Swedish Central Bank now thinks that they made a mistake in going too far with that. Because there are other reasons why, um, you know, say, for example, zero cash can be quite dangerous. In fact, I used the word dangerous carefully because mm -hmm. uh, you know, I watched a presentation by uh, the Swedish Central Bank saying that they're very, very concerned that if there is a cyber mm -hmm. attack on the Swedish uh, uh, payment network, that it would all go down. And at that point, there yeah. would be no means of payment. And they realized that there needs to be a, an alternative way. You can't just have only one way of doing something that is critically important, because of course, if people can't buy things for one or two days, that's a big, big issue. So um, is cash going to go away? I don't think uh, it is going to go away completely at any point at all. I think it's going to go down and stay stable. And then some countries like uh, in the US, for example, the amount of cash is going up. In, in, in Europe, the amount of cash is going up in circulation. In India, the amount of cash in India is going up. So in most countries, the amount of cash in circulation is going up. So um, the death of ATMs and cash, that's not uh, imminent. The one other final thing to say is that ATMs are not just about cash, because when mm -hmm. we look at the transactions we do on ATMs, cash is one thing, it's a very important thing, but there are lots of other things that ATMs do, things like unblocking cards. Now, this is one of the things yeah. that, uh, for example, Visa and MasterCard realize is crucially important, because if there weren't ATMs to unblock cards, then how do you uh, use your cards, uh, or what, you know, what you're going to do when... Your, your card is blocked, you have to go to a branch and that's obviously not the best way uh, uh, to do things. So I think ATMs are here to stay, partly because yeah. of things that ATMs do are much broader than just cash, but also yeah. because I think the good way to see an ATM is as an alternative to a branch. I think that's a better way to see it. It's not an alternative to a phone. Uh, it never yes. will be, but it's yes. more an alternative to a branch. As banks close branches, what they do is to leave an ATM behind or two ATMs behind and so on. So that the, 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 if you like, if there's a comp, bit of competition, the competition is between uh, branches and ATMs. How many ATMs yes. um, does the country need and how many branches does the country need? And given that branches are very expensive, then obviously banks have to kind of manage that evolution. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, I, I did also did uh, read somewhere in the... In the UK itself, even during this pandemic, the average um, uh, ATM withdrawal, uh, I think around 68 pounds, it has gone up to almost 90 pounds. So, you know, withdrawal of cash has gone, transactions have gone up uh, considerably, even in the UK during this pandemic time. So, obviously, uh, a zero cash, I don't think, is a, is a world that we will see, perhaps. Um, so, uh, Arvind, that uh, going forward, the Digital technologies, you know, have caused a shift in customer expectations, you know, with mobile and internet. It's, it's a big change that's come. The always connected app net, net, native and digital savvy customers have a heightened need for speed, you know, speed, convenience and engagement is what uh, I think the, the new gen and uh, customers want. What is the impact on the ATM industry caused by the evolving expectation of customers with mobile devices. Right, so very, very important uh, conversation there, KK, because uh, the most important thing is the ATMs must work in, in a multi-channel world, must work uh, so that customers can start transactions perhaps on a mobile phone and then fulfill and finish that transaction on an ATM. In fact, you know, one of the interesting things to talk about is a scheme uh, from MasterCard called uh, MasterCard Cardless, 
uh, which is one of the uh, things that we are working with MasterCard at the moment, where you can use a mobile phone, come to an ATM, and uh, uh, pre-stage your transaction and get cash with that phone app, but get cash from the ATM. Yes. And most importantly, they can do that because it's MasterCard doing this, they can do that globally. It's not just something that you would do just with your own bank. So you can go to any bank and theoretically you can do that globally. This MasterCard cardless uh, um, concept is only just starting, but uh, my understanding is mm -hmm. that it will be made available globally. So I think those kinds of things are happening, integration of the channels. Uh, and of course, you know, the thing that people really, really want, you want to make sure that when you use one channel and you go to another channel, that the channels know about that, that it's instant. In other words, you don't want to be in a situation where you do something on, on one channel and the other channel doesn't know about it till the next day, which is the way it used to be, right? Yeah. If things were not uh, yeah. uh, immediate and real time. So it has to be uh, real time, has to be that all the channels work together. Okay, yeah. So, so you're saying that, uh, which was one of the uh, query I had, is that you know today in this pandemic world, people do not want to touch those touch points which the public in large is touching because they fear the, the spread of the virus. Uh, so I, are we saying that that you can go to an ATM kiosk, use your mobile and do pretty much all that that you would do otherwise on the ATM, uh, thereby you're not touching that, uh, that, uh, that device and do is just withdraw your cash and, and go away. Is that... Uh, is that uh, that is something that's coming up? Yep. So so that is something that is coming up. Uh, we have talked to our banks about it. It seems at the moment that uh, touchless ATMs isn't necessarily seen as a huge priority. Uh, but mm -hmm. so, of course, what the banks are doing is to make sure that uh, the ATMs are kept clean and so on. There's an interesting uh, um, white paper in the ATMIA that uh, people might want to download about uh, mm -hmm. using UVC. Uh, ultraviolet yeah. light in the C part of the spectrum to clean ATMs because in that way it is possible to potentially disinfect it between every customer. Uh, so I, I won't go into the detail of that, but there are technolo there, there are technologies that can be used to make sure that you know, all the touch stuff is, uh, is, is totally safe. So I think some banks will probably implement those features. Okay, yeah, I think uh, that will be interesting to see. Uh, are you working uh, from your uh, company point of view? Any, any such uh, innovations are coming through from, uh, for this, uh, typically for this pandemic kind of uh, thing? So, um, the, the, in fact, that paper was written by Cal. So, yes, we oh, are okay. very, <laughs> so do feel free to have a little look at that. So, we sure. are, of course, providing the software part of it. Uh, we, of yeah. course, rely on uh, the hardware vendors to provide the hardware part of it because obviously the, the ultraviolet light part has to come from a, from hardware vendors. Great. So just for the uh, uh, participants, could you please um, uh, tell us uh, the, the report name and from where we can download that? It is from the ATMIA, which is the ATM okay. Industry Association, the one that you mentioned initially, KK. And, yeah. I, and I think it is called uh, using UVC, uh, something like that. It is in their white okay. paper list. Um, okay. Yeah, it's in their list of white papers. Okay, good. So ladies and gentlemen, all those who are in the ATM industry, uh, I think this is a, a reference you must read, download that from ATMIA, ATMIE, and uh, you can go into the white paper section and, and read about it. So uh, let, let's move on, uh, Arvinda. ATMs haven't seen rapid transformation like say banks, okay? Say like fintechs are collaborating with banks and, it's, and that is happening like Apple, Amazon, Alipay, you know, they're all besides doing retailing, they are, do, they are also into, uh, you know, you know, financing, uh, getting into trade finance uh, and other things. What about the ATM industry? Any collaboration with retailers or other entities? So a uh, very interesting question. The thing is, I think in some ways it looks as if ATMs haven't changed very much. I think it's a little bit like that yes. duck that is... Uh, you know, moving along the top of the water, but it's paddling very hard underneath. A lot has changed KK, over the last uh, 50 yeah. years. So ATMs are about 50 years old. I don't know whether you remember that we celebrated yeah. the 50th year uh, very recently, but okay. a lot has changed. The, the technology is changing rapidly underneath. It is getting quicker and faster and better. Uh, mm -hmm. um, it is more reliable than ever before. ATM networks have yeah. amazing availability, much better than 99% 
at, at the best banks, they're coming close to 99.8% availability. And if you think a little bit about, mm -hmm. you know, how many things need to be working, you know, cash has to be available, you need to deliver the cash, hundreds of pieces need to be working together. Uh, that kind of availability is, is, is really quite uh, amazing. So uh, ATMs are more secure than ever before. And then if you look at the transaction set, the transaction set is wider than ever before. So some countries, uh, they make available uh, almost everything that you can do in a branch at the ATM, nearly 100 different transaction types. So these are things that have happened without necessarily being kind of seen by customers as you know, you know, a huge thing like uh, you know, what's happening on the internet. It's not so much in, in, in the customer consciousness, but a lot is happening and it is changing and it is integrating. Um, and, and perhaps the most exciting thing happening these days from a software perspective, from a, 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 a company like Cal's perspective, is that the yeah. ATM is getting integrated into more mm -hmm. and more of the back end servers and services in a bank. In other words, you are able to do the kinds of things that, say, 20 years ago, it was only a dream, right? To be able to pay your, uh, uh, your utility bills and create um, uh, open new accounts and do uh, biometric uh, uh, authentication, lots and lots of new technology. So it's kind of changed mm. quickly, but in small steps. Yeah, that's true. Uh, we've got, because, you know, the, the, the ATM box, I think I've seen it for many, many years now. It hasn't changed. Everything is the same. The looks, the feel, not even the printing has changed. You know, the the way the, the printer, the thermal thermal printing happens, and and the look and feel exactly the same for many years. So you know, I think um, seeing is believing. So people want to see that change, perhaps. And uh, so from what we are seeing, uh, what you're saying, I'm sure uh, there will be uh, a lot many changes coming in the days to come. Uh, ladies and gentlemen. I continue to have discussion with uh, Dr. Kurala, and uh, this is the time I would, I rather, I'm opening up a little early, the q and box, because I'm sure there are lots of people who are from the ATM industry or in some way related to ATM, uh, softwares and all that. Uh, so it's an opportunity for you to put in your questions right now uh, into the q and box, and I will, uh, uh, getting across to Dr. Kurala for, uh, for answering those queries. Should you want to talk to him directly, uh, you could do that also. Uh, raise your hand, and uh, there will be uh, the a team from the digital uh, member from the digital team will help you to ask the question directly. Uh, it's up to the guest to answer any direct questions or not. You know, there could be conflict of interest in many cases. So it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, it's uh, you know it's the chief guest uh, prerogative to answer. Or not to answer. Uh, so I'm, I look forward to your questions. Uh, please uh, send it quickly because uh, later on, it becomes very difficult to hold back the guest beyond uh, the stipulated time. Uh, uh, doctor, the ubiquity of mobile devices causes an ex existential threat to ATM. Uh, do you agree with this viewpoint? No, I don't actually because Partly because of what uh, I was saying a little earlier, because mobile phones can't dispense cash and it can't yeah. do anything physically. So it can't accept cash. It can't uh, endorse a check. So it can't do any of those kinds of things. But there is a second very important difference between ATMs and phones. And, and this mm -hmm. is not necessarily fully understood by uh, consumers, for example. Uh, when you use a phone to do a transaction, that phone is your own phone, of course. And it as secure as an ATM. In the case of an ATM, the ATM belongs to the bank and it is totally secure, or at least it can be made to be completely secure. Now, there are some examples where banks don't perhaps uh, secure ATMs very well and it gets hacked, but leave aside that scenario. If you think about when you use a card and pin transaction, the, the card, the chip card is incredibly secure because the keys inside the chip are the bank's keys. If you think about the pin pad, the keys mm -hmm. inside the pin pin pad are the bank's keys. Now, that's not the case when you are using a phone. So here's the thing. In the longer term, phones will never be able to be as secure as an ATM. ATMs will always be more secure because they are the property of the bank and the bank can make it totally secure. It can be as secure as 
uh, it can get very close to 100% secure, provided you use, do all the things that you need to do to make it secure. So that means that there's always going to be this question mark about the yeah. safety of mobile phones because they will always be attacked. They will, con they will continue to yes. be malware and there's a yeah. security issue. So if you compare a phone against uh, an ATM, the phone is obviously more convenient, it's yours and you have it there, but it can't do something physical. Mm -hmm. It can't give you cash. Yeah. But finally, and secondly, it can be as secure as, for instance, the, the ATM can be. When it comes to doing things like opening an account or doing a pin change, those kinds of things that the, the underlying technology needs to be totally secure, then today you can do that only on an ATM. Now, maybe one day there will be some evolution of the phone to make it even more secure. Perhaps I'm not saying it can never happen, but that's not the case today. If you look at most of the malware on phones, they're targeting banking apps. Why? Hmm. Because it's where the money is, right? So that, that battle is going to continue for a very long time to come. And if you look at things like interchange fees, transaction fees, those also demonstrate the, the, the levels of fraud. So uh, you, you see that uh, when it's an ATM channel, the costs are low for doing transactions because the fraud amounts are very, very low. On the other hand, if you do something that is a cardholder not present transaction, then the fees are high. Why? Because the banks have to carry much higher levels of fraud. And you know there's a big question about whether the public will accept that fraud levels can be as high in some of those other channels. Uh, and today the public accepts that because they're saying, well, you know, the banks will pay. But then you have to start thinking about what is that fraud doing? Where's that money going? I remember some years ago, KK, I was in a presentation in the yeah. United States by the police and CIA mm -hmm. and so on. And they were saying that money that is uh, uh, defrauded on payment channels quite often get then uh, uh, um, um, siphoned into really bad stuff, mm -hmm. you know, terrorism and um, and, and, and really serious criminal stuff. Now, once the public begins to make that connection that uh, bank fraud is not just something that costs the bank, but it costs uh, people, then they're, they're going to start saying, well, you know, is it yeah. acceptable? Can you just say it's a business case? Can you just say yeah. it is, you know, profit and loss thing? It isn't because that money is going to a place that we consumers, we the public don't want it to go. Uh, I, I totally uh, agree with uh, what you're saying, uh, you know, from a security and uh, the cash dispensation problem. Uh, the not, nothing can replace an ATM. I think uh, what perhaps, uh, you know, uh, the public in large is looking at is uh, the use of uh, mobile to facilitate a payment out of, uh, out of uh, the ATM. I think that's uh, something that I, I'm sure people would love to do it. So they are on the move. They do everything. They come and just pick up the cash and go, something like that. You know, like the Mastercard card list that you talked about. That could be a great uh, change. That, uh, that, that right. So we already support that that transaction first with Mastercard, but also with banks. So today yeah. that transaction is available usually bank by bank. In other words, the bank makes that idea of the phone uh, to to get cash uh, available just for their own customers. With MasterCard, the exciting thing is it'll be available potentially, you know, off us. In other words, you can go to any bank and do that. It'll take some time because all the banks okay. have to agree and support it, but uh, it is exciting. I agree. Yeah, true. So, uh, uh, Doctor, I told you that, uh, and that you know, we could get questions on the Q and A box as well as a direct question. So, we have a direct call question that he wants to ask you. Maurizio would like to call, will do, like to ask you a direct question. Uh, could I request Maurizio to unmute and uh, ask the question to doctor? Hello, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you. Uh, I can't hear, by the way. My audio stopped, but okay. I'm... Um... I'm going with my question. Hi, Ravinda. Um, Hi. Talk about the uh, about Sweden uh, regretting their decision to uh, move to zero cash to cashless society. Uh, but uh, I heard that also the Netherlands uh, wanted to go cashless by 2025. Um, are they going to change their mind uh, based on what you said about hacking? 
uh, the system and uh, not giving people a way to uh, buy goods and stuff, or they are going to go ahead as well uh, anyway. So, Maurizio, I don't think either of those countries is going to cash less completely. So, uh, as you know, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, they use uh, Cal's ATM software. And what they're doing is to uh, streamline their ATM network. They're going to reduce the number of ATMs. But that's because, um, you know, the, 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 uh, the current way in which they deploy ATMs isn't that um, efficient because banks compete with each other, obviously. And there are locations where there are three ATMs when one ATM is sufficient. So what they're going to do is to just change all of that. And they're going to have a national ATM scheme. Makes sense, I think, for a country like the Netherlands. I don't think that there's any concept that the Netherlands is going to go to zero cash. I don't think so. Sweden is in a slightly more sticky situation because they allow their infrastructure for cash to go down a lot. So it makes it very hard for them to change direction. In that presentation that I watched, uh, they were saying there are multiple scenarios they were looking at. One of them must look at cryptocurrencies. Um, and perhaps one thing that the Swedish um, um, system might do is perhaps uh, the, the Swedish central bank might create a, a, a national cryptocurrency. That's my idea, not uh, something that I, so I'm not telling you something that I heard from the Swedish government, but maybe some of uh, you folk know that uh, uh, China is probably going to have a central bank backed uh, cryptocurrency. So those kinds of evolutions would be potentially quite interesting. And we need to see obviously how it is implemented. You know, does the cryptocurrency require a network in order to be able to uh, make payments or not? I think the critical question is, do you need the network in order to do something or not? Uh, you might remember a long time ago in the UK, there was something called Mondex, where the idea really again was a kind of cash that you can pay that's electronic, but without needing the network. So I think this stuff will evolve. I think cash will not go to zero in most countries. And um, Sweden might be the exception, but that's because they've allowed the, um, the network to deteriorate a, a lot. And it's not clear in my mind anyway, whether they can reverse that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Maurizio, uh, for a good question. Uh, I have a question coming to you, uh, Rinanda, from Frederick. He's, uh, so let me read the question a little long, longish question. Uh, you see more and more local initiatives from banks to mutualize, consolidate ATM estate. Example, uh, Geldmart in the Netherlands, Bankomart and Otto in Scandinavia. As this initiative pop up the strategy in my opinion is less replacing branches, but reducing cost by joining forces and outsource commodity services. What is your view on this? I think pretty so much. So I agree with that. Yeah. yeah. I agree with that. So this is about costs. Uh, eight, um, banks obviously mm -hmm. see ATMs as a cost center. Uh, yeah. I don't fully agree with that, but we parked that conversation for the moment. It is, of course, a cost. There is a cost. The question is, is there revenue that matches the ATM uh, as well? And I think there is, but, but we parked that conversation for a little moment. But it is a cost. And obviously, if you can do something uh, for uh, 10 as, um, amount of money uh, and you can uh, and today it is costing 20 then you want to do it for 10 right that that makes sense uh, however this idea of national networks like you said for example sweden uh, did that uh, the netherlands is doing that other countries are thinking about it belgium is thinking about it as well so uh, the smaller countries are doing that will the bigger countries do that is it possible that one day the united states for example will have a single national network. I doubt very much because firstly, yeah. there's going to, because banks also compete uh, and there are antitrust regulations, uh, lots of things to work through. Will France do that? Will the UK do that? I don't think so because they're not talking about that just now uh, because obviously ATMs are also a method for banks to compete, to differentiate, to provide new functionality and so on. Because when you look at where, say, the Swedish network is going, and by the way, the Swedish network runs Cal software, just to tell you quickly, and the Dutch uh -huh. one will also run Cal software in the future. Okay. But that's going to be seen more as a public service with a limited number of transactions. So you won't be able to do some of the things that 
you know, some banks would do today, transaction types that are bank specific, uh, th that, um, you know, that's not the plan as far as I understand it. I'm not saying it's not possible, but mm -hmm. what happens is that once you have a organization that's focused on cost reduction and delivering cash, then other kinds of things that you can do uh, with the uh, ATM then needs to be, you know, becomes what the banks need to do in some other way. So hard to know where these things will go. Uh, obviously, cost reduction is very important. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. you. You touched upon Sweden and uh, in the earlier call also uh, from Maurizio talked about it. So just for uh, the point of interest, uh, in the Sweden, how many ATMs are there? Just if you, roughly, roughly. I can't remember the number of ATMs in Sweden. No, um, sorry, no. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's fine. I just thought because it's a cashless uh, oh, country. well, I mean, there are a lot of ATMs. There still are a lot of ATMs. Cash, okay, oh. cashless in quotes, but uh -huh. still a lot of ATMs. And, and Cal software runs those ATMs, okay. uh, is running in those ATMs. Uh, it's uh -huh. not zero. I can guarantee you it's not zero, but I can't remember <laughs> yeah. exactly how many. I'm sure if your software is running, it has to be there. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> yes, it is. Yes. Okay, Along let's with take... a partner of ours. So we have a Scandinavian yeah. partner uh, called yeah, yeah. Every, and it's our software and their software. Okay, that's nice. I have another uh, query uh, coming your way. Is Kwang from Zungo, Zung Do Kwang. He asked a question. Uh, I hope I've uh, pronounced him correctly. Uh, so, uh, sorry if I have not, haven't. Uh, can you suggest us some ATM authenticate methods for cash withdrawal and what will be, uh, which will be a trend in the next two to five years? Well, okay. So, um... Interesting um, uh, question there. Firstly, card and pin is going mm -hmm. to be still the most important method. The reason is that that is global and will work internationally. I mean, can you imagine mm -hmm. that you can just get on a plane and go to anywhere in the world and, and put your card in and get cash out? Now think about that. That's an amazing yes. achievement that the ATM industry achieved, right? You can't do anything else like that because you know that card is your card from your bank in the country that you live in. And you can go to the other side of the world and get cash. Can you think about how much has to work for that to um, all of that chain? Because you're taking cash out, right? I mean, maybe you're a fraudster, but it can be done in a secure way. That's really amazing. That won't be changed in a hurry. So for instance, if you think about biometric authentication, um, would that be possible that you get on a plane and go to anywhere in the world and your face uh, is used for you to get uh, uh, cash? No, because you know why? You probably don't want your biometric everywhere in the world. You, people are going to say, no, no, thank you very much. That don't want my personal private data everywhere in the world. So if you think about it that way, right? What yeah. will happen is that I think there will be nice, very exciting ways of interacting with the uh, um, uh, the bank, especially your own bank, where it's between you and that bank that you bank with and, and you trust them. And there may be interesting ways of doing it. Like for example, facial recognition today, we or support facial recognition as well. So for example, we have 2000 ATMs in Kazakhstan where mm -hmm. uh, you use your card and your face uh, to do a transaction, but you can't do that in some other part of the world because uh, it's, because you know all the stuff about biometric data, right? So I think there are going to be nicer, better ways to do it. One final, uh, very convenient way of getting cash from an ATM. We support contactless transactions. Maybe you know that on a uh, uh, on, on a card, a bank card, uh, um, there can be contact and contactless mm -hmm. ways of using that card. So, for example, in Russia, our Russian bank, you can just click uh, touch with the card and get cash out. That's really quick and easy. Um, mm -hmm. So those are, you know, multiple different ways in which you, uh, you know, uh, authenticate yourself and authorize the transaction. Yeah. So taking a cue from that, and this still requires a card. Uh, how about use, how about uh, wearables? You know, because you're going to have right that right. wherever you, yeah, wherever I go. Yeah. Definitely. So if you have, so think about a card, in a card, there's a little chip, right? That chip yep. is the critical piece. The, the thing mm -hmm. is, who gave you that chip? Is that the bank's chip? If it's a bank's chip, it can be very secure. Now, you can put it anywhere, right? If the bank gives you a chip and you put it on a, 
uh, on a wristwatch or, or, or you attach it to uh, your phone or, or you, you have it on a ring or something like that, then that stuff is, is equally secure. But when you use a, a normal phone, you're not using the chip of the bank. You're using your own chip that you got from the GSM company. Different kind of security, not the same security. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I have a next uh, uh, query uh, coming your way. Uh, it's come from Sajan Yos. He uh, says, uh, hi, Aravinda. As you know, ATMs uh, and, the and the transaction switches have been using NDC plus uh, slash 912 messaging standard, which has its own limitations. With the next standard, speaking of especially in Eurozone, what are the major USP selling points which you perceive for a bank to really consider it as a game changer while integrating ATM channel with the rest of their digital channels. So Sajan, uh, you know, NDC is very old uh, to date. Um, it is also very restrictive. It's a technology that, uh, you know, was designed uh, in, in the eighties by, you know, one of the uh, uh, ATM hardware vendors. Um, there is a new protocol called Nexo uh, that has been designed in Europe. Um, and it is an open standard. Uh, we would always propose that banks go in that direction. However, if you ask the question, if you have got a banking ATM network, should I, and I'm running NDC, should I immediately go to Nexo tomorrow morning? Then no, because there's no business case to change from NDC to Nexo, uh, even though Nexo is more flexible, et cetera, et cetera. However, when you change your software anyway, let's say that you have a project to go from Windows 7 to Windows 10 and you're changing your application software dramatically anyway, that is a good time to leave NDC behind and go to something like Nexo. Nexo is the only uh, global open standard for ATM. So I would say it's a very simple choice, just choose Nexo because there isn't anything else uh, to, to consider and it is open. You can join the Nexo committee. Uh, you know, they meet regularly in Europe, um, I think in, in Paris. So anybody can join. Okay. Uh, I hope uh, Sanjani so you got your query uh, answer. Um, so uh, Arvinda, it said relevance is the only antidote to obsolescence. How is the ATM industry across the globe preparing to stay relevant in these digital days? Okay. So I think one of the really interesting things that's happening with the ATMs, KK, is that... Um, yeah. You remember you were saying a little earlier, the ATM hasn't changed very much. It's that big thing with printers yeah. and so on. However, there are some small ATMs uh, being uh, built and being designed, uh, but also uh, just changing that whole footprint and the way that it works. So one of the things that is happening is that you can create an ATM just from components, if you like. We have some mm -hmm. ATMs like that running in Germany, for instance, where there are pieces of ATM card reader, a pin pad, and so on, connected to the cloud. And our software is running in the cloud. Now, here's mm -hmm. the interesting thing about that. Now you can have different devices configured depending on a case-by-case -case basis. So maybe there are some scenarios where the business case is that you, don't, you can't uh, you know, put a $20,000 ATM, but you, you do have a business case for something that is a $500 ATM, right? So, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's quite interesting. Um, conversation to have, you can actually do ATM-like transactions at $500 mm -hmm. or $1,000. It is actually possible to do that. Uh, it's a separate conversation. But once you start thinking about devices that are much lower cost and hosting and running your ATM solution application in the cloud, instead of having one ATM per 1,000 people, like in the United States, maybe... Yeah. You could have 10 per 1,000. Maybe you can have 100 per 1,000. Maybe those ATMs are in those places that, uh, uh, that consumers go to, not in a bank branch. That's not where you want the ATM. You want it in a cafe. You want it yeah. in the swimming pool. You want it in the gym. Why do we not have access to our banking in all the locations we go to? Because ATMs are too expensive today. Now, we support... Yeah these kind of lower cost ATMs today. And like I said, we've got 2000 of those in Germany already where those are in those kind of ATM like machines 
are inside uh, Shell petrol stations, okay? Uh, where mm -hmm. there's a small device that's much lower cost and that's able to do ATM-like transactions and you can do banking stuff, you can do, you can get cash, you can pay. It's more like a POS device than like an ATM. But anyway, the summary is that ATMs are reinventing themselves. They are getting smaller, they're getting niftier, they're getting, uh, they're becoming more secure, they're integrating mm -hmm. with the cloud, they're integrating with the back end of the, the bank. Big, big changes, uh, KK. But the, here's the thing, right? Customer goes through it, yeah. taps his card, gets cash, and he says, whoa, hasn't changed in 50 years. You're right, because, yeah. you know, it is just quicker, faster, better, smarter, everywhere. Hasn't changed, but it is, it yeah. has changed, right? Underneath, it's just totally different. <laughs> because in a way, think about it, right? Yeah. Think about cars. You might say, well, the car hasn't changed. It's still, it's still got four wheels. Yeah, right? But think yes. about how much has changed. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll remember the uh, uh, this you gave of a of a duck uh, that you know there's a lot more going underneath it, <laughs> a lot more activity, <laughs> but it remains the same. Rajendra from Rachalwar, sorry, Rajendra Rachalwar asked the question: During last one quarter of pandemic period, as we observe customers coming back to doing transactions in the ATMs, but importantly, the withdrawal ticket size is about 20-25% higher than before, indicating that customers are visiting less but are using the same amount of cash as before. Do you see that as a new normal? Um, sorry, uh, the question, uh, sorry, what is the new normal, uh, uh, KK? I, I'll right. come back to you. He says that the, the uh, that uh, I'll just read it out once again. It says, importantly, uh, the withdrawal ticket size is about 20 to 25% higher than before. So indicating that customers are visiting less, but using the same amount of cash as before. Well, actually quite interesting uh, that in Very the United States, yeah. yes. during coronavirus, the amount of cash in circulation has gone up a lot. Now you would say, well, how is that possible? Because you would say people have nowhere to spend the mm. money. Why has the amount of cash gone up? It's because when people are worried, when people are scared, it doesn't matter what they're scared about, then they hoard cash. And yeah. you see, this is one of the big yes. things about cash that electronic transactions can never replicate. It's that conversation we had about Sweden. It's that conversation. So here, in the case of coronavirus statistics in the United States, the reason they're hoarding cash is not because they think banks are going bankrupt because there's no conversation about banking being in trouble or any of that stuff. But they feel nervous. Mm -hmm. They are worried. They're worried about their families. What do they do? They take off more, more cash. So what is happening in the US is they are taking more cash out. And I think, KK, you mentioned in the UK as well, amount of cash in circulation has gone up during the coronavirus. Yes. yes. Whenever the public is nervous, they rely on cash. They take more cash out. And that's why cash is a uniquely important um, way of payment. It will, in my opinion, never go away. Yeah, I'm sure it will. Uh, By the way, Kiki, <clears throat> I have an answer for you about the number of ATMs in Sweden. There are okay. 2,600 ATMs in Sweden, uh, tell, uh, my colleague Jim tells me. And uh -huh. if you compare that with the European average per yeah. population, the average in Europe is about one ATM per 1,000 uh, people. In Sweden, oh, yeah. the average in Sweden, it's about one quarter of that. So obviously much less, yeah, yeah? but still it's not zero. 2,600 ATMs in Sweden and all of them have Cal software inside. And cash inside too. And cash inside too. <laughs> Okay, uh, let's take the next question. Satish Kumar asked the question, as we explore MFA in ATMs, biometrics plays a major role. We know that in, in that an authentication done through the EPPS are secure. How can we make the biometric authentications more secure? Biometrics, that's the first question. Biometrics can be a convenient way for the customers. With convenience, there is threat to security in banking. So how can we enhance this? So in my opinion, biometric is sufficiently secure already. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the 
the complication around biometric is about privacy and access to that data and do you trust your bank and more importantly are you happy with that data being available some in, in some other place now, there are two answers to that uh, if you look at the phone uh, answer is to store the biometric data only on the phone and not store it centrally so that's a good answer right but that one doesn't quite work for atms because you, you don't want to store your biometric data on a particular atm which makes no sense so then if you are going to store it centrally there's a question mark about whether consumers are happy with that now i think the question was asked in the context of can i only use biometric i wouldn't recommend that and he said multi-factor authentication anyway. So if you use a card and facial recognition, in my opinion, the security is more than sufficient. So facial recognition is just as secure, if you like, as using a four digit pin. And I think that security is good enough. However, card and face, you cannot mm -hmm. do an off us transaction. Meaning yeah. that because then the biometric data has to be everywhere, um, yeah. especially in that ATM context. So I think so like I said, also, uh, KK, we already do that in Kazakhstan. We also do uh, already do card and face transactions in Kazakhstan. There's a, there's a camera looking at the customer. Uh, you come up to uh, the ATM and you put your card in. And then if it recognizes you, it, it, it gives you cash. Oh, OK. Yeah. Interesting. That's, that's, uh, <clears throat> I hope, uh, Satish, uh, you got the answer. Uh, let's take a question from the media. It's uh, from India. Uh, Mr. Krishna Tripathi from ETV Global. Uh, he's the editor of ETV Global. He wants to ask a question to you. Uh, Mr. Tripathi, can you please unmute and ask? Uh, yes, Mr. Arvinda, am I audible to you? Yes, hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, though the question has already been raised by uh, Mr. KK in some sense. Uh, in 2016, when Prime Minister Modi announced note ban, he said that the era of paper currency has gone. And now we have option of digital currency. And uh, this, uh, I just want to, uh, wanted to ask you, what gives you confidence that uh, ATM industry will, be, will stay relevant in the era of digital payment? I have a second question. Uh, you talked about uh, low cost ATMs like $500 or $2,000 ATMs. That could be useful for rural sector in India. So any Indian bank has shown interest in those ATMs and whether we can manufacture such kind of ATMs here in India without importing them. Sure. So let me ask the second question first. So in terms of these kinds of smaller ATMs, banks are definitely interested. There are obviously lots of details around that. And of course, I think, you know, some of the parts, certainly the, the, the final device can be manufactured in India. I don't see any problem with that. However, some of the critical components like the card reader for ATMs, things like the pin pad, to my understanding at the moment, they're not uh, currently manufactured in India. It's not that it's not possible. Of course, it's possible. Some company needs to kind of decide to do that. So if you buy those components from where you need to buy them, uh, so the card readers, for example, um, the, the leaders for creating card, uh, car, um, you know, great card readers are, are the Japanese. Uh, you might want to buy those components. It's, you know, it, it's a decision for each company to make. Uh, pin pads um, uh, are manufactured in China, in some other countries as well, in the US and in Europe. Uh, you need those kinds of critical components. And then, of course, you can create a, a low-cost device, like you're saying. You asked about paper currency versus digital currency. This is a very interesting conversation, right? Because here's the thing about electronic payments. Today, electronic payments have to go through a central network. And if that mm -hmm. network goes down, you can't pay. And that's a big issue. Um, it's an issue that's not going to go away in terms of the way payments work today. However talk about currencies, it changes a little bit. Because with paper currency, the reason people hold it is because you don't really care about the network. You can pay your debts or you can give money to your son without anything working. Electricity can go down and it works. That's why people trust paper currency. No, currency doesn't have to be just paper. It could be something else that's physical. And you will remember, historically, people use gold and all those kinds of things. I'm not recommending that. Digital currencies, especially a cryptocurrency that doesn't need a network. So if you look at the Chinese cryptocurrency, in my opinion, that's a very interesting direction for banks to go in, for the central bank to go in. I think other central banks will begin to do that as well. Something for the Indian central bank to look at. Let's imagine that the Indian central bank creates 
a digital cryptocurrency backed by the Indian Central Bank, linked to the Indian rupee, so that the value of the cryptocurrency is guaranteed by the Indian Central Bank. Now, it has absolute trust from the people. And finally, if that cryptocurrency can be spent without a uh, reliance on the network, mm -hmm. you can spend it between phones exactly like paper currency. At that moment, I agree, paper currency might go away at that point, but we are not there yet. We are not at that place where we have a currency that is a true currency that you can spend between individuals without relying on the network and without relying on um, something physical. Today, th that technology is available only physically, either paper or coins or gold or something like that. But one day there will be digital, but not yet today. Uh, I have a follow-up question on the low-cost ATMs. Uh, in terms of capacity, uh, can they hold the same amount of currency? Because uh, law and order is a problem, transportation and logistics is a problem in uh, India. So can they hold the same, of, uh, same amount of currency like the other traditional ATMs? Okay, so there is a, uh, let me try to, uh, there's a very interesting way of doing this uh, that is different from your assumption there. If you think about a small village, uh, if you think about how much cash is in that small village, if you think about the cash that is inside the, each of the shops, then the amount of cash, most of the cash in that village is circulating in that village. And these low cost devices, what they can do is to circulate the cash that is already at the retailer. So when you use this kind of $100 or $500 device, what you do is do an ATM transaction, but the cash comes from the retailer's cash register. Now, in order for that to be possible, the Indian government will need to change regulation because today, regulatory wise, my understanding is that you can't do that in India. Okay. So once you are willing to consider changing regulat uh, the regulation, then what happens is that the ATM is able to recirculate cash without all that cost that you're speaking of. If you look at any village, most of the cash is circulating in the village until somebody from outside comes in and spends some money or takes some money out. So maybe that's 5%, right? Mm -hmm. Each of the villages yep. is a little cash community. And these little devices allow cash to be recirculated in those villages. But like I said, it probably needs some regulatory change before it is allowed. So, but Thank in you. India, Thank we you. have, a, we, but in, in India, we have a banking correspondence and POS machine that uh, does the same job. Uh, there is really a need. Uh, uh, I think those are Indian context, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Tripathi. Let's uh, uh, so we can, you know, take that a uh, little differently, and uh, let's uh, co-focus on the uh, international global aspect of it. Uh, let's take another or another audio. Uh, can I request? Uh, yeah, this is coming from Mr. Prabhakar Kaza. Good morning, Mr. Kaza. He's from Good morning. London. Yeah, he's a counselor out there. So, Mr. Arvinda, you got to be careful what he's what you say. <laughs> he's an ex CEO of State Bank of India. Uh, uh, London branch, of course. Uh, so, Mr. Kaza, can you please uh, unmute and ask a question? Uh, right. Hi. My question. Uh, my question is about uh, the amount of cash that Indian ATMs dole out. I believe it's uh, one lakh or one lakh plus on a daily basis. Whereas in UK, the maximum amount of cash that you can withdraw from the ATM is only about uh, five hundred pounds. You know, how can we have a digitalization or digitization of currencies and all that uh, with this kind of high level of cash being in circulation? I do understand the fact that overnight you cannot make uh, a, uh, India into a cashless society. It has to be on a gradual process. Otherwise, the cash will stop coming into the banks. And uh, there was one question that you asked about, uh, or we spoke about, that uh, we have... Uh, uh, we have in UK at least, or I'm sure in India also, people standing in large number in queues outside the ATM. Main reason being that cash has stopped coming to banks. Since this is not the forum for uh, discussing why cash is not coming to the banks and from whom, I'm sure the, the reason is obvious. The money launderers are not bringing the cash mm -hmm. to the banks as such. Okay. One. Just one more point, sir, on this, uh, your uh, 
uh, cryptocurrency. I've attended about 12 uh, seminars on cryptocurrency so far. My fundamental conviction is that it's a currency for crooks and criminals. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so I, I think on the crooks and things, I, I will leave that conversation because that's a big conversation. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, on the uh, question about people queuing at ATMs, you know, people shouldn't have to uh, queue at ATMs. Uh, in many countries, people don't queue at ATMs. Uh, I, I live in Scotland, in, in Edinburgh. I have never had to be in a queue uh, to take cash out. Uh, maybe sometimes one person in front of me. So, you know, the reason that there aren't enough ATMs is because ATMs are too expensive to own and operate. Our technology and some yeah. of these lower cost ATMs are making it possible for those ATMs to be less expensive. And I think that has got to be the direction in which we go in the ATM industry. We need more ATMs, lower cost ATMs. They need to be more available and very, very important that the public shouldn't have to, um, uh, to queue, right? They should be able to go there, do th what they want to do, and, 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 and then go away without having to be in a queue. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kaza, for the question. Uh, thank you, Arvinda. Arvinda, you are a leading ATM software provider, having multi-country presence across the globe. How do you envisage future-proofing the ATM industry for sustained, profitable growth? I think uh, we touched on some of that already, KK, which is yeah. cost reduction for the banks to be able to operate those ATMs at a much lower cost. And I think we are going in that direction by having smaller devices uh, th that can be uh, uh, deployed in many more locations, running software in the cloud. So I think uh, partly it's about uh, cost reduction, but partly it's about being more relevant to what people want to do, to be able to do the transaction types they want to do, to be able to do that with the other channels to be able to do integrated, uh, seamless, multi-channel transactions. Okay, yeah. Uh, can we have uh, next audio, Harish, experienced banker. Uh, Harish, make it quick, please. Yeah, uh, the ATM originally when it was invented, you know, it was supposed to be an alternative to the branch, right? And uh, of course you've uh, stated that it still just uh, does a lot of cash uh, pin change and the normal transactions. But, uh, you know, in India also, and probably globally, it was supposed to be doing a lot of vast transactions, value addition services, bill payments, X, Y, Z, and uh, which essentially from a future point of view is going to, you know, reduce the, the branch uh, load or whatever, right? So, but has the ATM, I mean, in India, I don't think so vast transactions are getting done as much. So what is the future outlook for an ATM? Will it actually reduce the uh, uh, need for a branch and all these uh, you know, transactions get uh, done to an ATM? I think it does reduce the, the need for, uh, uh, for branches. In Europe, when banks close branches, you know that's been happening a lot over the last 20 years. They, they leave ATMs behind because it's the next best thing to, to having a whole branch. Uh, so yes, I think so. Uh, if, we, if I look at some of the countries where Cal Software runs with lots of transactions, uh, sure. in China, for example, they, they do about 100 different transactions uh, on our ATMs because, because they want to and they want to have uh, the, the ATM being almost the, the same as the branch in terms of what you can do uh, at the ATM. So, so yes, I think uh, ATMs will help uh, the number of branches to be reduced, but also when the footprint of the ATM becomes a little bit more uh, flexible, not just these big gigantic machines that KK talked about, but also these smaller $500 type transactions and everything in between, then I think um, you know, the opportunities are much bigger than they have been in the past for the ATM industry. Thank you, Arish. Thank, thank you, uh, uh, So now uh, we are uh, at the hour at four o'clock. Uh, can I hold you back for a couple of minutes? Arvinda? Sure, that's fine. Okay, so I have a query from an anonymous attendee. In the current world ATM, interchange fees are shrinking and there is a serious danger that ATMs will, extinct, will be extinct. Uh, IADs will cease their activity and bank only will deploy ATMs uh, in branches and their number will reduce as well. Looks like governments have to introduce some regulations to protect access to ATMs and cash. What should be the industry's response to this situation? Well, 
this is a tricky question actually because interchange yeah. fees uh, to some extent are a little bit of a strange way of doing or of running an industry anyway because it is regu- uh, it, it's a, a price that is set across yeah. a country for example but but how crazy is that it's a little bit like saying coca cola should be you know uh, uh, 30 pennies across the the united states who would say that nobody would say that uh, so here's the thing the reason the interchange mechanism doesn't work is because it is not a proper capitalistic pricing mechanism in my personal opinion so this is probably getting into a little bit of a debate and religious discussion and i don't want to kind of go into too much detail on that but quick summary is in my opinion interchange doesn't make a lot of sense i don't think that's the way it should be when i want to go and take cash from um, uh, my atm i want a service i as the user so i should have to pay for that if when i take uh, 300 pounds of the atm it says okay the transaction fee is 20 pennies that's be fine you know i should pay for that because that you know you know because that's my transaction the idea that my bank should pay for it and should be hidden in my uh, statement in a way that i can't see it, it it just makes no sense in my view um so i think what will happen is that interchange will go away you know that uh, in australia that happened a while back they they went to direct charging i think the australians did the right thing um i think interchange fees will go away and we as consumers will have to pay uh, per transaction when we take uh, cash out and then you know what if there is proper competition then it will mean that the cost of that transaction uh, fee will go down really low in places where the cost of delivery is very low because there be competition and in places where it is a rural area perhaps there needs to be some government regulation for those rural areas but allow competition to manage the, the cost then i think we'll be all fine i think the only reason interchange doesn't work very well is because it's a crazy way of doing things because uh, it, it, there's no market mechanism yeah <clears throat> can i ask the last question um, and this relates to software so proprietary software across the atm landscape gives rise to increased complexity and costs of managing the atm network shouldn't the industry be aggressively adopting multi vendor software in the in the current era of uh, open standards and open architecture and uh, interfaces and apis of course kk absolutely you know multi vendor atm software is how cal started in this business and that's what we are known for multi vendor atm software means that the same software runs on every atm that a bank has independent of whether uh, the the manufacturer is a or b or c um absolutely um completely crazy that it, it, it isn't the case i mean think about it from a pc perspective imagine that when you buy a pc uh, the the vendor says that you know if you buy it from sony you have to run Uh, Sony software. If you buy it from Dell, you have to run Dell software. If you uh, b- buy it from some other company, you have to buy yeah. their software. That would make no sense. Now that's the way the ATM industry has been in the past. So, uh, but you do say that you know it's not hasn't been adopted. That's not quite true, really, because most of the big banks run uh, multi-vendor software. If you think about banks like uh, you know Bank of America and Citibank in the US, uh, HSBC and uh, um and unicredit and ing and uh, westpac and so on all the big banks they do run multi vendor atm software all the chinese banks have been running multi vendor software for a very very long time china construction mm-hmm. bank okay. for example who is our customer so the big banks do the smaller banks there is a special case if you are a small bank and you have only 100 atms then the likelihood is that you buy that those 100 atms only from one vendor you're not going to have seven different vendors for 100 atms in that situation perhaps multi vendor software you know isn't your top priority even though in my opinion there are still some advantages in doing that so i think that's what's happened the bigger banks are multi vendor the tiny banks are not and then in between it kind of it's a case by case basis okay thank you <clears throat> so uh, uh we uh, come to an end of uh, today's show ladies and gentlemen i think uh, we had a wonderful discussion uh, with uh, dr arvind Uh, arvind uh, kurala and uh, so uh, i leave you with this uh, thought uh, that uh, with banks less willing than before to maintain large branch networks like the brick and mortar network i think that's something branch banks will not go for because it's not 
efficient enough. ATMs will be the key to delivering cash to these customers where the public at large is located. So ATMs will not be going anywhere. I'm pretty sure about that. Uh, so is doctor saying the same said the same thing so uh, that's that's here to stay uh, and uh, so we will see a lot more innovation a lot more transformation that will come and that i think is a need of the hour because atms haven't changed much though the uh, the duck example that uh, uh, rivinda gave is ex uh, is correct but we want to see that visible change i guess uh, so uh, thank you every thank you uh, 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 doctor coming over and spending some time with us. Um, thank you uh, all the participants uh, from India and from the globe. Uh, may I request you to feel, please fill up the feedback and share it with us. You, you'll see it on your screen in some time. With your suggestions, we will keep innovating our platform that will soon be completing 100 webinar sessions nonstop from the month of May. This is our way of contributing to the fight against COVID. We can't be going in the front line and fighting COVID because we are not doctors, but at least we are bringing uh, audiences, participants across India and outside in, in having some meaningful discussion in this one hour. Once again, uh, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in uh, thanking Dr. Arvinda Kurala to have come here, explained to us, answered all your questions absolutely wonderfully. Uh, thank you, uh, Arvinda, for coming and spending time with us. Thank you, KK. Thank you very much. I enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Bye.